Good morning, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar by the Employee Ownership Association. My name is Deb Oxley. I'm the Chief Executive of the EOA, and it's my very great pleasure to welcome you all onto today's webinar. My role this morning is to chair um, and uh, invite our guests throughout the morning, uh, the next 45 minutes, to contribute. Also, to take some of your questions. Um, if you'd like to ask questions, please use the Q&A tab at the bottom of your screen. Um, if you want your question to be anonymous, just put the word anon in front of your question and we won't reference your name or your organisation. If you just want to share some views and thoughts about uh, what you've heard um, or anything else to do with the current crisis, then please also use the Q&A function for that. If you've got any technical challenges, uh, can you use the wave, the hand? Um, and my colleague Hannah, who's helping drive all of this this morning, will be able to help. So um, it's a week since we had our first webinar. Um, we've been delighted by the response from members, suggesting lots of topics and ideas. But undoubtedly, the one topic that's exercising every business at the moment is that of cash flow and how to sustain a business throughout this crisis in order that the business is strong enough to come out the other end. And of course, for businesses that are employee owned, one of the biggest challenges there is thinking about the people. Um, and so today's session is very much focused on job retention. And you'll have seen from the, the, um, the promotion of this morning's webinar, we were joined today by uh, two guests who run employee owned businesses who have both experienced different uh, approaches that they've implemented to the whole job retention challenge and also joined by another guest who's a HR expert. So we've got a great panel, uh, not just to share their insights and their personal experience of the last few weeks, um, but also to take your questions. Before we do, um, I think it is worth just reflecting on how fast everything is moving. Certainly in the last week, we've had uh, lots of feedback from our members uh, that are at trying to access some of the cash facilities that the government has made available. And I think it's fair to say that there has been a bit of a pushback on some of the banks who are insisting on personal guarantees. Um, I do hear on the grapevine that somewhere between six and nine banks have now removed that personal guarantee requirement. Um, and if, like me, you were watching uh, the Secretary of State for Bay's um, announcement last night at the press conference, you'll have seen there was a strong pushback there from the government onto the banks to behave in a way that's supportive of the economy. And I understand the Chancellor is about to make some announcements tomorrow evening um, around the loan guarantee schemes. So things are moving really fast. Um, I'm sure what we discussed today and some of the questions you have uh, may even be resolved over the next 48 hours as the government continues to respond and it is doing a good job of listening and responding. So if you're facing challenges, if you um, are not getting the access to the funds that you want, please do tell us about it because it's important we can take your views back into government. Uh, we have a survey running at the moment specifically on the access to funding. So that's on our COVID-19 page. So if you can go onto the EOA website and fill that survey in, uh, in order that we can gather your views, your experiences of what you're actually hearing and feeling and seeing, it will be really helpful because we can feed that back in to the government. And indeed, this afternoon, we will be sending a letter to the Chancellor um, to represent the employer and community and to make sure that the EOT and the EBT, its predecessor, are both explicitly referenced to the banks in the business interruption loan scheme um, provision because we've had some feedback from members who have said that their banks have used that as a potential excuse to not engage with them around the Sybils. So having said all of that, let's move on to this morning's um, agenda. So I'm absolutely delighted we've got three speakers. Um, I'm going to introduce the first one. This is Joe Ritzema, who's the Managing Director of WCF. Good morning, Joe. Good morning. Um, Joe is going to share with us her experience of the uh, challenge of how do you manage fairly and respectfully your employees during this crisis. I'll hand over to you, Joe. Thank you, Deb. Good morning. I'll start by telling you a little bit about WCF. We started life in 1911 as a cooperative and became partly employee owned in 1988, with the original members of the co-op also becoming shareholders at the same time. 
over the past 110 years, our success has been achieved by having a diverse range of businesses. Today, we are one of the country's top 10 fuel oil distributors with 14 depots from Norfolk to Northumberland. Our tankers deliver oil to homes, farms, filling stations and businesses. In addition, we have 10 stores in Northern England selling pet and equestrian feed, toys and accessories. We have a seed potato packing business in Perth. These three businesses are classed as essential under the COVID-19 government guidelines and all have seen an unprecedented surge in demand in the last three weeks. In addition, we also have a mail order business um, selling clothing to the over 70s, all of whom are now self-isolating at home. We have a campsite and on the Friday before the social distancing measures were introduced, we completed on the acquisition of a grass seed business. In total, we have around 300 staff. So what does our EO structure look like? We operate a mix of direct and indirect employee ownership, and we use our EBT to purchase shares from the old cooperative members when they wish to sell. Our employees are contractually obliged to purchase 100 shares when they join us, and we lend them the money interest-free to do so. The majority also choose to save for shares either through our partnership share scheme or third party, save as you earn. They also benefit from free shares if we hit our performance targets and a cash ownership dividend annually. In the main, our employee engagement is fulfilled through our decentralized structure. And I want to talk to you about our recent communication strategies. Our priorities in dealing with the current crisis were managing a remote workforce at over 30 different locations and maintaining a fair balance between those who were in work and those who were not. Because we process orders for goods, two thirds of our employees simply did not have the option to work from home. The huge surge in consumer demand also meant that we needed to keep people in the workplace wherever possible. We introduced the daily briefing to colleagues, which we collated after the Prime Minister had spoken each evening. In it, we unravelled what it meant for them. We also circulated the Public Health England guidance, which I find is absolutely excellent. We were honest with our employees from the start that we were looking to safeguard the long-term future of the business, even if this meant that we had to make some difficult decisions in the short term. I believe that that secured their understanding throughout. Balancing the moral dilemma with the commercial reality has been one of the hardest challenges of this crisis for me. We really up the ante on recognition to ensure that our colleagues know that their efforts are being valued, even though we're not seeing them daily. This can range from a personal letter or email from me, a call, or even just a quick endorsement on social media. The feedback we've had is that these have been very, very much appreciated. So how have we managed the financial implications around job retention? The majority of our employees are hourly paid and receive SSP only. We made the early decision that this would be extended across our salaried workforce so that there was no differential and made it clear that those self-isolating for any reason would receive SSP only. Our weekly wage bill is £130,000 and we knew that it would be foolish given we had no idea how long this crisis would continue to make any promises that we would cover wages in full. This was really difficult. My heart wanted to cover them and tell everybody it would be okay, but my head knew that this would not be possible. We immediately introduced an employee financial wellbeing programme where we offered to match the difference to what an employee would normally receive in the form of net pay. This was offered to those self-isolating and also those that needed time off to care for their children when the schools closed. This would be in a form of an advance that would not be repaid until the employee was fully back at work. Our initial repayment period was three months, but we've already extended that to six months and possibly further to ensure that it's fit for purpose for each individual employee. Just over a week ago, we, it, we became clear that we needed to close the campsite. We've tried to stay ahead of all the government announcements so that we were ahead of the game. And again, we closed that uh, before the government forced them to. In addition, whilst our mail order businesses have not been required to close, and we've been able to adopt what we believe were sufficient self-distancing measures, the numbers of people in the building and their growing fear meant that we just weren't being productive. We were also conscious that clothing was not considered by the government and indeed that clothing retail stores had been forced to close. 
So we gathered together a very small group of loyal people, less than 10% of our workforce, and asked them if they would be prepared to stay on in the building to try and help the business through this crisis. Their only role would be to take and process customer orders. They all agreed. Once this was in place, we got everybody else together to tell them that they were being furloughed for the minimum period of three weeks. They would receive 80% of their salary through the job retention scheme and could top up the remaining 20% through the Employee Financial Wellbeing Programme if they so wished. We also offered those remaining in the workplace an additional work week's pay to ensure that there was a fair differential between those staying at home and those continuing. We are now just over a week in. The furlough protects those employees with caring responsibilities and allows them to stay at home whilst retains a core team to help us adjust to the inevitable short-term drop in demand whilst also serving our customers' needs. Employees can be brought back in gradually depending on their role and their personal circumstances. We've also extended our offer to those vulnerable categories who have been advised or told by the government to stay at home for 12 weeks and they will receive 80% of their pay whether they've been furloughed or not. Any staff that need to work from home for part of the time have been promised 100% of their pay when working and 80% when not to ensure that they don't lose out. The company will obviously fund that on their behalf. In conclusion, whilst it's regrettably inevitable that the current crisis will result in some financial loss for some of our staff, we hope that by using the Financial Wellbeing Programme, we can shield them from the immediate financial impact of this and then collaboratively manage their financial position when they do return to work. We've provided an incentive for those that are able to work, remain in work to be able to do so and ultimately, hopefully, ensure that we have a business fit to return to when this is all over. If I can finish with an extract from an email I received from a colleague last week. I can't tell you how proud I am to work for WCF. I am so impressed with the realistic, practical and egalitarian approach you have adopted. Please be assured of my full support, support and commitment, especially during these challenging times. Thank you for listening. Thanks, Joe. Gosh, what a story. Um, I can tell from uh, your voice um, that wasn't as easy an activity to undertake as you communicated it very rationally. Can you maybe just tell us a little bit about the decision making, how you, you've created this bespoke programme that you referred to as the Financial Wellbeing Programme. Um, I guess people on this call will be interested to know a little bit about how did you, how did you uh, decide on that as a programme? You know, was it just you, were other people involved in that decision? Um, it was led primarily by, by me and again from this moral dilemma of recognising that people weren't sometimes able to remain in the workplace even when they, they wanted to um, and maintaining that fair balance. In none of this did we want our employees to be disadvantaged. So I came up with the, the outline of, of what we wanted to do, shared that with, with the team and then we got input um, from primarily the senior team when we first launched it, but the whole programme has been adapted based on feedback from colleagues as we've gone along, really. Um, so now it's pretty much a bespoke programme that we can tailor for, for individual colleagues, depending on what they need. Can I, can I bring Paul Seath in at this point? Paul's HR partner at Bates Wells, and um, welcome, Paul. Hello. Um, so you just heard Joe's uh, account of um, a business that responded very quickly. I mean, you talked about staying ahead of the game, Joe, which uh, you have, given that this has only been our new world for the last two weeks. Paul, have you got any reflections that you want to offer on, on what you've heard? Or um, are, are there other businesses moving at the same pace as WCF? First of all, fantastic work that has ha they've done. Um, no, a lot of businesses are not moving uh, that swiftly, um, but those that are are obviously putting themselves in the best possible position. And my observations on what we've we've heard are the immediate desire to reinforce the organisational values um, in respect of staff and to to look out for them, but to do that in a way that recognises the economic reality that whilst there might be things that the organisation wants to do, it won't always be possible. But by doing what, what you've done, 
um, and taking the measures you've taken and the financial wellbeing program being, I think, pretty innovative. Um, and I'm sure that's something that other organizations will want to want to follow. Um, reinforces your commitment to the staff and you're seeing the staff repaying that. That note that you, you, you referred to at the end is probably the sentiment of, of pretty much everyone in the business. Um, so, so that is, is some good that can come out of it. Um, and I also think it's, it is important that, that you've recognized the idea that there is a disparity potentially between those who are asked to continue working and those who are going to be furloughed um, on, on some sort of pay up to 80 80 percent um, and to ensure that we don't have resentment or, or issues further on down down the line so all of all of the um, uh, the strategy there that's been adopted I think would be a real role model for um, for, for others and I'll certainly be taking some tips away for, um, for, for, for my clients that are knocking on my door so I think it's great stuff We've had, um, we've had one question in Joe um, about how are you keeping in touch with employees whilst they're on furlough? Yep, so we are doing a um, weekly newsletter to them, telling them what we've been up to, things like how many orders we've packed, what the revenue has been, just to give them some reassurance that the business is continuing and that there will be something at the end. And then within the, survey, within the newsletter, there's an embedded review survey technology, which now allows them to share what they've been up to while they've been off so that they can keep in touch with each other as well and still feel part of the team. Yeah, I think, uh, again, what we're hearing from the, the membership is whilst the issue of cash flow and keeping the business financially uh, stable during this period is the priority, the very quick second priority is, and how do we help our people? And recognising there are at least three different groups, aren't there? There's the, the staff who carry on working because they're in essential key worker positions. There's um, the staff who are furloughed and um, are not able to do anything. Um, then there's also people working from home who are dealing with the challenge of caring duties, whatever they may be, and just this whole new world of working and how, you, how do you ensure that all of those stay on the journey with you? And indeed, that's one of the topics we're gonna to be covering in next week's webinar, which is about the mental wellbeing challenges for all of those groups. Okay, I'm sure we'll come back to you, Joe and Paul, um, in a few minutes. I'm now going to ask if you two can go on uh, mute and stop your video. I'm now going to introduce Nicola Ryan. Um, Nicola is um, Director of People at Rollinson Knitwear, um, another well-established employee-owned business um, who have, in the last few weeks, had their own challenges around this same topic. Um, uh, I've taken a slightly different approach, uh, an, an, another um, hybrid approach and a, a very bespoke approach. So I'm going to hand over to Nicola now to say a little bit about your experience. Thank you, Deb. Good morning. Um, yeah, so Rollinson Knitwear is a supplier and distributor of school uniform. We employ 60 colleagues, mostly in um, the UK and our site in Greater Manchester, Stockport, and um, a small number of colleagues as well overseas in Bangladesh and Egypt. We were established in 1935 as a family business and we became employee owned in 2015 um, in an incredible six months from proposal to completion, which was from an approach from the leadership team to the shareholders and that is now fully paid. Um, we are majority employee owned using the indirect model, which we, um, which is, we think is fairer to all and especially the lower paid. Um, and it's important for you to know that of our colleagues, over half of those colleagues are in roles that are traditionally lower paid, like operational warehouse production roles. Um, so at Rollinson, um, the, the approach that we've taken really was a phased approach. Um, so our first phase, we termed the be sensible phase. Um, because colleague wellbeing is more important to us than anything really, and we genuinely care for each other at Rollinson, we were responding to the changing situation right from the start and even when the threat appeared to be low. And so initially we gathered all our colleagues together and we spoke with them about good hygiene, about cleanliness. Um, we issued colleagues with care packs of tissues and hand sanitizer and we asked our colleagues to be vigilant and not to come in work if they had symptoms. So this was termed the be sensible phase. 
Um, our next phase, as the situation developed and, and progressed, was the essential only phase. So the essential only phase was um, not only in direct response to the virus, but also the fact that in our industry, school closures happen first, and then of course the closure of retailers following the government announcement. And as we saw this happening, we discussed really openly with our colleagues um, things like pay reductions as alternatives to redundancy. And what was amazing and continues to be amazing about our colleagues is everything we've suggested, everything we've discussed, our colleagues are really supportive of. And many colleagues offered greater sacrifices and greater reductions in salary than those that we were proposing. Um, when the government announcement came regarding the furlough and the covering of 80% of salaries up to £2,500, that was a huge relief to us. And um, several of us, as we watched that, you know, cried um, because of how brilliant of them to offer. And subsequently, actually, 75% of our colleagues have been furloughed this week as our customers close for business. So um, all our furloughed people will receive half the difference between their normal pay and furlough. And um, <clears throat> for most of our people, that's 90% of their usual pay. And the leadership team are still working, um, but on average on half pay, which we had set out initially before we were aware of the government support and, and our leaders have committed to. Um, and one of the things I wanted to mention is one of the unintended consequences um, is that a few of our colleagues who have been furloughed have volunteered for NHS duties, which we're particularly proud of and which we think is just brilliant. So. It was sad, but was right that we furloughed every colleague who uses public transport um, better for the health, better for social distancing and, and for everybody. Um, and we also furloughed early on those people that we felt were vulnerable. Um, one of the things that Rollinson does as standard anyway is we, we really focus on multi-skilling. So we knew we had the skills within the business to be able to continue the, the skeleton crew that we operate today with colleagues. And it meant we were able to prioritise those that we wanted home and we wanted safe and we wanted out of harm's way. And we were also really incredibly lucky that we asked for a temporary increase of overdraft just before the loan scheme was announced, which was approved last week and with no personal guarantees. So um, in terms of communication, we have all been learning some new skills when it comes to communication and the start of this crisis and, you know, and, and everything that's been happening marked the start of video updates that myself and my colleagues have been sharing regularly. So uh, currently we do two video updates every week with colleagues to let them know what's happening in the business. Um, we also use Slack for business for anyone who, who doesn't or hasn't used it, it's a bit like social media for business, so really user friendly. So it means our people can quite easily express their response in, in comments to anything that we share and, and they do and we're really pleased with that, but also can use emojis if they want to express their thoughts in other ways as well and let us know that they've seen the update that we have shared. And in terms of the, the kind of um, the, the other the results of this on the other side some of the feedbacks that we feedback that we've had from our colleagues have been amazing and, and really heartwarming um so if i could share some comments with you that we've received recently from colleagues um one colleague says there is no company i would rather work for in a crisis another colleague says it's a tough message to deliver we are all in this together team rollinson love to all um one of our newest starters said so glad i joined rollinson Another colleague said, this is more than a place to work for me. It's family. I'm happy to give up holidays or do whatever is needed. Another colleague said, it's great. We're looking at the positives on the other side. There's too much gloom everywhere. So nice to hear a bit of positivity. And finally, we had a comment that said, I feel so blessed to be part of such a fantastic family. Um, so we're particularly proud of that. Thank you. Thanks, Nicola. Wow. Another another story of a business that was well ahead of the curve. Um, so you implemented the salary cuts before the gov government announced the job retention scheme. Can you just say a little bit more about exactly how the furloughing's working? I'm not sure I quite understood exactly how you've implemented the furloughing. You talked about 70%. 
Yeah, so um, the majority of our colleagues have now been placed on that, that leave of absence, the furlough leave, and we are operating with a, a small skeleton crew. And of those, those who can work from home have been doing for quite some time anyway. And those that cannot, we have a, a very small number of colleagues in with really strict distancing measures in place as well to protect their well-being and safety. And I think we approached it from a, a, a way that was absolutely right to us, which was that we, we have the skills in the business because people are really flexible and, and learn and learn the roles of each other anyway and are able to cover um, a, a multitude of, of roles um, and so we prioritise those people that we wanted to be at home and actually people who wanted to be at home themselves because they were maybe at particular risk due to the virus they had pre-existing health conditions or they were travelling on the bus or the train um, and um, that was the way that we looked at it really to get those those guys home. So it's interesting your, your sort of your decisions around who to furlough which I've seen we've had questions during the week about you know how do you choose who to follow yours decision making criteria on that more or less followed the government guidelines which is if you're vulnerable if you've got underlying health conditions if you need to travel unnecessarily those are the people that potentially you could follow but you only were able to do that because you've got this um this approach to multi-skilling across the business where everybody can do everybody else's jobs well, yeah, and also I think um, that we have a business where we genuinely like care for each other, and and so we we care for colleagues, and they know it. They know that we care for them, and so we were able to have really open discussions about that as well. Because yeah, we just want to do the best for the business, but obviously people's you know personal circumstances were really important as well, and that we did the right thing. So um, we were able to talk really openly about that and what it meant, and our colleagues were really grateful and really respected our honesty too. Can I just bring Paul in again? Um, because there's a Nicola mentioned something, Paul, about uh, how how delighted they are that some of the furloughed staff are volunteering. And a question we had before today's uh, webinar that was uh, pre-provided was um, around can people work when they're furloughed? So obviously we've got volunteering that's not working, but can you say maybe a little bit more about that? The, the furloughing rules and the guidance has been very clear from the very initial announcements and, and guidance that came out on the 20th of March, which is that you, you cannot do any work or provide any services or generate any revenue for your employer whilst you are furloughed. Um, you are free to volunteer for other organisations. That's absolutely fine and to be encouraged, I think. Um, there's a question mark around volunteering back for your own organisation. Um, the guidance is unclear, but, but a lot of organisations were rather hoping that people could be furloughed and then volunteer their services back, um, which I think would be seen as a, as a mechanism to circumvent furlough, so uh, it should be avoided. But absolutely, um, volunteering for uh, uh, other uh, organizations in your local area or community community um is, is is a fantastic and super thing to be to be doing just no work for your um, your employer and a question that again we had before today's webinar uh, submitted by somebody anonymously was about staff holidays so in that following period what should is there a technical or a legal definition of what should happen around holidays a lot of thought is being given uh, to that. Uh, oh, I think we might have just lost Paul. Paul, you, you, if you can't hear me, I think you've just crashed or you've just frozen. So um, we'll, we'll come back when Paul's ready. Do you want to unlock your camera? Um, and it'd be I, interesting. I, I, oh, Paul, you're back. Sorry, you froze for a second. Oh, so you, 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 yes, everybody else froze. I could see myself, so apologies. I, I carried on not knowing who could see me. Okay, do, do, sorry, you were just saying about holidays. Holiday, yeah, it, it might be, be seen on one level would be quite difficult to take holiday during a period when you can't go out. How much of an actual holiday is that? Um, the rules under the working time regulations governing holidays have been amended to allow a carryover um, over the next two years for holiday, and I think employers will welcome that. Um, because what we are seeing, certainly in, in my business and, and I'm sure others, everyone's cancelling holiday at the moment that they had booked in. 
um, which leaves a bit of a problem further on down the line when everyone's going to want to take holiday when we'll need everybody in. Um, so that and I suppose I, I suppose there's an issue there about mental well-being as well, about absolutely, the responsibility absolutely. and duty of care of the business on making sure employees get a break from this, you know, because most of us are doing this. If we're working from home, we're doing this a lot. Um, yeah. Yeah. I think for those people that are working throughout this ought to be encouraged to take some holiday and to switch off. Um, the other thing I think with homeworking for, for a lot of people who uh, may have done it now and again, will find, I know I'm finding it, your day starts about seven o'clock because that's when you get up and you're, you're at your desk and it can run on to 11, 12 o'clock at night just because you're, you're very near your computer. Um, so I think it's quite important to try and just have some clear uh, rules around when you're going to stop um, and, and the organisations can, can encourage its staff to do that where it, where it can. Um, otherwise, you, we're going to get burnout, uh, and that's going to be, yeah. uh, be a problem. And, and mental health—I know that's the subject for next week, but um, that's going to be a real key. Uh, did I did I read somewhere last week that there was some um, uh, legal perspective on the of carry forward of annual leave, Paul? Yeah, yeah. The, the rules have been changed so that you are now allowed to carry over your annual leave over the coming two years. Previously, right. the rules didn't allow you to carry leave over. Um, and the reason for that was to prevent employers from stopping people taking it. Now it's recognised that we've got a, a, a slightly different situation. And so some leave is going to be uh, uh, able to carry over. I mean, what some organisations are looking at doing is we're going to furlough you for three weeks, which is the... Looks like we've... Um, Paul's, Paul's crashed again. But um, can I just bring... Uh, Nicola, Joe, can I bring you back in again? We've had a question Minimum about... Period, Sorry, Paul, we lost you again for a second then. I'm lost back. Him again. Um, yeah, you just keep uh, just halting slightly. I'm just going to move on to the topic of recruitment because we've had a question from somebody asking if um, Nicola and Joe, you might comment on what's your policy on recruitment during this period? Um, is everything on hold? um and uh yeah is everything on hold and what happens if you've recruited somebody who's just started um are you able to put them straight onto furlough okay shall i answer that so if they yeah. weren't employed with you on the 27th of february then currently you can't furlough them so for recently joined staff that's that's an issue um so we are we're still recruiting in the businesses that we have that are classic within essential where we need to um, I think ours will be a phased approach, so some of our businesses will be busier than others at different times. So we will be recruiting okay. and furloughing almost on a bit of a roller coaster now until we get through we get through this. So, Nicola, have you got anything to add to that? Don't feel if you have to. Yeah, no. I mean, we 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 only had a limited amount of recruitment ongoing at that point anyway, and so that's suspended at the moment. But what we did have is a, a couple of individuals who were due to start with us at future start dates who volunteered to postpone their start dates actually, which I, I thought was excellent, and are really looking forward to working with us as as and when things change and and we get busy. Another question um, relates to how do you plan to bring people back. Um, so, um, if you don't need everybody straight away, um, because production's only just ramping up in both cases, because you've both got, you know, production style businesses, then how can you stage that comeback? And I guess Paul question is there, is there any opportunity to bring people back on a part-time basis? So maybe Joe, Nicola first, then on to Paul. Okay, um, we will we will definitely be busy. So we're bringing back a couple. So our first three week furlough runs out next Friday. So we will be bringing a couple of people back into the organisation to help us run run the, the the process. The remainder will probably remain on furlough. So I can see us bringing people back in very much on a staged basis and um, throughout. Some of ours is relying on what our suppliers do. So at the moment, that's out of our hands until all our suppliers return to work. And lots of our roles cannot start, even though we're, we're, we're still processing orders. So it will very much be a phased, phased process. Okay. 
Is that the same for you, Nicola? Um, no, we will need everybody back straight away. And at the moment, what we're doing is we're, we're spending a lot of time communicating with colleagues who are, are furloughed, who are in the business and, and kind of saying to them, like, take this time to, to rest. And um, the best thing you can do for the business is to stay home and do the right thing and making sure that you don't spread the virus, but also make the most of it because we're really going to need you when we're back in. Paul, is there, a, is there an opportunity to bring people back part time? Not, not, not at the moment as under the furloughing rules. So there's nothing to suggest that you could start to bring people back and reduce your claim under furlough. Um, the same rules apply throughout, it seems to me, in relation to not working. Whether we will see that change um, remains to be seen, but I suspect that the expectation will be that employers phase people back in um, and, and agree whatever they're going to pay them for, for, when they, for when they start to return. So at the moment, the furlough scheme doesn't um, accommodate that. I did what hear... We found, so I was just going to say, what we found um, very much, which is an employee ownership, employee engagement issue, is very much people will do whatever is right for the business. So we've had people who can't work from home full time because there's not enough content in the role who have quite happily agreed to take 80% of the pay when they're not working, but still remain available 100% for when they are working. That's not a furlough, that's done between us and them. They've agreed to vary their contracts of, in terms of engagement. And I think exactly the same when they come back in the business. If we don't have enough work full time, then we'll be seeking their, their engagement and their agreement to vary their terms temporarily come back part-time and we didn't have a single issue with anybody that we asked to do it the other way around far yeah. from it actually and as you say that's probably a, a feature of the employer ownership culture so. isn't it yeah and uh, the interesting couple of questions here on some technical issues i think to do with um a really interesting uh, question here about if in keeping people up to speed during furlough by communication you know emails newsletters maybe the occasional phone call could that be interpreted as work right. <clears throat> you froze for a second there hopefully you can still see me um, yeah no I don't think that can be seen as work okay. um, it's not earning a revenue and um, it is not providing a service and indeed there is an obligation on an employer to continue looking out for its staff welfare so I would even think there's an obligation on employers to keep in touch with staff. Um, so I don't see that that's a problem then. Um, another question that's come in, very technical. Um, if somebody's on furlough and they have annual leave booked, uh, are they taking annual leave? So is that on the same principle or does all annual leave stop if they're furloughed? Well, furlough says that once you're on, on furlough, all of your other terms and conditions continue to apply. So if you, if you take that at a straight reading, that would suggest that your, your furlough period then becomes a period of holiday and you've effectively agreed that your holiday will cover that. Now, whether that's been thought through from a uh, from the guidance perspective remains to be seen, but I would imagine most people will try and cancel their holiday whilst they are on um, furlough leave and the, uh, the the business will then need to respond to that it seems to me and either have a line that says we will allow you to cancel it um, or or we won't um, and I think that's going to be very much a, a, a personnel issue and an engagement issue um, uh, uh, for, for individual organisations. Joe, Nicola, have you got anything you want to add on either of those? No, just our understanding is that you can't take holidays when you're on furlough um, but you still continue to accrue them. So that's how we're, we're, we're working at the moment. So. Okay, um, a, a very specific question. Uh, Paul, I think I'm going to have to point this at you, uh, which is very EO specific. Um, is there a requirement when you run a, a business using the Employee Ownership Trust model, EOT, um, is there a requirement to consult with the trustees before a decision is taken about um, either the furlough itself or whether or not the firm is agreeing to pay the 20% top up? Mm. Uh, under the furlough rules themselves, there isn't a requirement for that. There is only a requirement to discuss it with employees, um, as employees. So no, as far as the furlough rules are concerned, and no, as far as the rules are concerned, if you are going to top up. But in terms of whether or not at an organisational level you ought to be doing that, I think it would be 
determined by your trust documentation um, setting up those um, those forums and uh, also culturally is that the sort of thing that you would typically expect to be discussing with those with those individuals um, so, so, so no I don't think there's a specific rule laid down by government um, it'll be organization by organization to take a view on that but clearly communicating and, and taking a view has got to be seen as a good thing um, and, and people appreciate that on the same topic of um, of trusts uh, questions come in can a furloughed employee continue being a trustee the guidance is completely silent on that um, the guy the, the guidance says that you, you cannot provide services to your employer um, you could see how that might be interpreted as providing services but equally we might be saying well actually there are certain duties as a uh, trustee to discharge um, and I think an organization in those situations would need to think carefully about perhaps taking a bit of a risk on that one and saying well we are going to furlough you and we're going to argue very strongly further on down the line that your duties as a trustee and your role as a trustee is is akin to an alternative job and the rules say that you can be furloughed from one job and keep the other one um, and so by analogy one would hope that that would be the way that it's approached um, but the guidance i'm afraid is is completely silent they, they, whoever so far they, they've not thought about that in, in preparing the guidance but they are uh, being rather pragmatic in how they're adapting to challenges and issues that are arising and so that may well be something that um, it, it is addressed further on down the line but no at the moment the guidance is, is silent i'm afraid i don't suppose any of us can criticize the government for not having thought through that specific question given that <laughs> they're trying to roll something out across the whole economy um we are coming up oh sorry nicola yeah i just uh, wanted to add really that in I, I guess a lot of this will vary depending on the way that the organization is run and certainly at rollinson the leaders decide everything in the running of the business um, and trustees are not involved and, and currently for us means that our um, employee trustees are furloughed, all three of them. Um, and I thought I was, that was worth mentioning. So, yeah. Okay. Thanks, Nicola. Um, just one, one last question that I wanted to just put out there, which I think is a really great one. It's an idea, actually. Um, somebody said, as far as furloughing is concerned, um, we, we want to use the opportunity to do ongoing training. Uh, to up to staff to upskill themselves learning new software some are teaching each other how to use zoom and screen share etc is the panel's understanding that fellow allows this training to take place yeah can i answer that one if that's all right yeah yeah so our understanding is that is that training can continue and actually um i think i think what's been what's one of the positive things from this is that people are picking up new skills often without even realizing it so i've loved hearing from our colleagues that they've been using things like zoom and slack and um and you know them being really proud actually that by the time they return to work they'll be like really skilled in those things but um locally to, to us there's an excellent off offering actually from um um, that from a government back scheme that will offer remote training to colleagues and, and just this week in our latest update we've said to any colleague that is interested in learning new skills whilst they're furloughed that we'll be able to hook them up with that scheme and and them to do some remote training from things like digital skills conflict management um there's lots available and if, if people want to do that because I, I think not just from a skills point of view but one of the things that we've been particularly concerned about is things like colleagues feeling lonely or you know struggling for things to do and i think it's been particularly helpful to them for to for that as well okay um i'm really sorry i'm gonna have to call it a day we've can you believe it we've run out of time um can i thank uh, nicola joe and paul um i've just been jotting down some notes as we've talked uh, i guess some of the lessons and learnings that we've we've learned here is um entering into this period of furlough for any business uh, you really should be planning early so we heard from both joe and nicola how they were well ahead of the curve so even if you're not thinking you need to do it now, start thinking about planning for it um, so that you're ahead of that curve. Talk to the employees before and during, and Joe's point, be absolutely honest because they will respect that honesty. Um, use the tools that are available, job retention scheme, for example, the loan schemes that are available, but don't be scared of innovating and creating something that's bespoke for your business. 
And, and that's what we heard from both WCF and Rollinson, how they've innovated and created their own um, hybrid approach almost to implementation of the JRS. Um, the importance of ongoing communications whilst employees are furloughed um, and the opportunity for training, as we've just heard. Um, and to personalise some of that communication, Joe talked about uh, you know, personal emails or personal phone calls and how much they're valued. And you heard from both businesses the feedback they're getting from their employees. Um, and I think probably Paul made the point, which I rung true for me, which is how businesses approach this will be a symptom of their values as an employer and business in particular. Ac accepting and hoping, of course, that we're all going to come out of this at the end. So the way we behave now will be very much how we are judged in the future. So thank you again to all of you. Um, I probably have just got a couple of housekeeping things to say, which is there will be a survey at the end of this webinar. Please do just take two minutes to fill it in. Really important we understand if we are giving you what you want to hear um, and any other topics that you think we should be uh, digging down into over the coming weeks. Um, continue to go to the COVID-19 website um, on the EOA website also the COVID-19 page which is where we are signposting you to information and next week's webinar and I can see the slides just appeared on screen um, will be focused on the mental health and well-being agenda which we sort of touched on today so um, I hope you all have a good rest of the week and the start of next week before we see you again next Thursday thank you again to Nicola Paul and Joe for your valuable contributions um, and goodbye, everybody. Thank you. Thanks, Bye. Thank you.